started. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar to learn more about the launch of a new behavioral health profession, Certified Wellness Coaches. My name is Amy Blackshaw, and I am the Behavioral Health Project Director at the California School-Based Health Alliance. We are really thrilled to be hosting this webinar today, and we're so glad that you're joining us today as we deepen our knowledge about Certified Wellness Coaches which is an exciting aspect of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, CYBH, and to think together about the potential roles for wellness coaches as part of a school-based health and wellness center team. As we're all getting settled and folks are logging in, I just wanna go over a couple of logistics. Um, we are recording this webinar and we will be posting the recording and the slides to our website in the next couple of days. We'll also email this out to our entire list of registrants. Um, so you'll be receiving an email to follow up. Um, we have the Q&A enabled, so feel free to use that to put your questions. We're gonna have ample time for Q&A later in the webinar. Um, and we may do some responding live, or we may hold questions or lump them together if they're similar. Um, but please feel free to uh, start populating the Q&A. You can also respond, add comments or reactions through the chat. Uh, we really welcome interaction. So um, I'm from the California School-Based Health Alliance, and we are a statewide nonprofit organization whose goal is really to, we sort of sit at the intersection of education and health. And our goal is really to improve the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. So we really are based in two concepts of healthcare should be accessible and where kids spend most of their time, which is in schools and that schools should have the services and support to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. So our, our work really aims to support the growth and best practices of school-based health centers and wellness centers and school health programs in general. And a big part of our work is to gather school and health professionals to organize convenings, to support and disseminate expertise and best practices and models of care that are having a real positive and meaningful impact. So you, our website link is coming, there it is. Uh, so please take time at some point to look at our website. We have lots of resources there for you um, and uh, information about future seminars and workshops that we'll be offering. Many of you have attended our annual conference um, in the past. Uh, if you haven't, we invite you to come this year. Uh, our conference in 2024 will be held April 29th through 30th at the Santa Clara Convention Center. Um, it's really an, an inspiring conference uh, filled with school health champions. Um, right now we've opened registration, it's early bird, so it's a discounted rate to um, register. And we're also accepting abstracts to for folks who want to present at our conference. If you are doing something innovative or that you're making a big impact in your school community, we'd love to know more about it. We'd love to share it out. So um, you can find out more about submitting an abstract by going to our website. And there's a um, the yeah the links are in the chat already for you. Okay. We are, um, our resources are available to anyone. We have lots of resources and trainings and webinars for free on our website. You can participate in any of those things, but we do have some extra benefits for our members. And so if you're interested in becoming a member, go to the link that's also being dropped in the chat right now for you. One of the biggest benefits is a really um, big um, discount for our conference. So we have a $200 discount uh, went for our members. So members can get additional tools and resources as well as some individualized technical assistance for your organizational needs. <clears throat> so back to our 
opening slide and the topic of our workshop today. Many of you have probably been following closely the various work streams of the, the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. And for others, this may be fairly new information. CYBHI, as we call it, was launched in 2021 and is really a groundbreaking effort of $4.4 billion that's aimed at transforming the way California supports the well being of children and youth. It is led by California's Health and Human Services Agency and involves multiple other state agencies, including the Department of Healthcare Services and the Department of Healthcare Access and Information. And CYBHI really is aimed at reimagining and transforming the way we support the wellness of children and youth by ensuring that support is available when and where and in the way that children and youth need it most. So this is really exciting in that it allows us to think more broadly about what supports children and youth mental wellness. And wellness coaches really fit right into this broader thinking. The wellness coach workforce is an aspect of CYBHI that is really focused on growing the behavioral health workforce and importantly, bringing more support into schools that more directly represents and has more shared similar lived experience with the vibrantly diverse backgrounds and experiences of California's children and youth. So we see lots of opportunity in the new wellness coach model and see it really as a substantive way that we can grow school-based health and wellness. There are many potential roles for wellness coaches as part of a school-based health center and wellness center team. And we wanna to continue to envision what this might look like um, over the next year or so as we get closer to the launch of wellness coaches. So today, uh, we have someone from HCHI to share with us more details about wellness coaches. Our speaker today is Ben Gamash. A little background about Ben is he started his career in the biological sciences as a researcher, working at two national cancer research institutes, both in the US and overseas. Transitioning from research, he is now dedicated to human health and wellness in the domain of healthcare policy. So he presently is the, a policy analyst at the California Department of Healthcare Access and Information, HCI, where he is leading the development of the emerging certified wellness coach profession. Through this role, he applies his scientific background and policy knowledge to contribute meaningfully to the intersection of wellness and healthcare policy. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ben, who is going to get us started. Wonderful, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, really appreciate that background information and that wonderful introduction. So as Amy mentioned, I am Ben Gamash with the Department of Healthcare Access and Information. And today I'll be presenting an overview of our wellness coach model, uh, some updates for those of you that are already familiar and have been tracking that, and then some information for those that are brand new to this as well. And we are gonna be providing lots of contact information and ways to follow up. So please uh, feel free to reach out to us so that we can connect with you if there's a deeper dive that is desired. So a little bit about HCHI, a rather new department. And the mission of this department is that every Californian should have access to equitable, affordable quality healthcare. So that is the lens that we come from, uh, and we're always thinking about this in terms of equity uh, throughout the state of California. And as the needs of California's healthcare has expanded, HCHI is also responsible for managing many different programs um, that have grown and expanded as part of this. So the Wellness Coach is just one of many. Um, so, you know, HKI is definitely involved across many, many work streams. And part of that, um, a little bit of history as well, is we were the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. And then it was in 2021 that we moved into a department to reflect the growing portfolio and a more descriptive name. So some of the uh, areas that we support 
are to increase a health workforce that serves medically underserved areas, represents the California it serves through racial and language diversity, and supports Medi-Cal members. We also offer financial support in terms, um, in addition to uh, the health workforce. So that includes organizations expanding educational capacity, individuals to pursue health careers through scholarships and loan repayments, as well as organizations to build the workforce pi pipeline. So again, HKI is involved in many different initiatives, support both our workforce and our education. So as Amy mentioned, the uh, need for certified wellness coaches came from the California Youth and Behavioral Health Initiative, which is a five-year plan to transform the behavioral health system for children and youth. And as part of that, HKI received $338 million to design and build this new certified wellness coach role. And this role is specifically designed to increase overall capacity throughout the state of California uh, of our behavioral health workforce to build a public behavioral health workforce that better represents the diversity of California's children and youth. Um, that is something that we heard loud and clear as we were doing a lot of our engagement is we uh, really need to see individuals that better represent the broad diversity that we see uh, throughout California. I'll touch on this in future slides as well, but uh, another part of this was to fill some of the workforce gaps that exist today. Uh, and we wanted this to be a desirable occupation in and of itself, as well as a stepping stone to more advanced behavioral health roles. And I'll touch on that as well. Because this is part of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, this is directly supporting children and youth age 0 to 25. And the intention is to support these vulnerable populations where they live, study, and work, which is why the school system and school-based health centers and wellness centers is such an important aspect of this work. So this role was developed uh, over a rather extensive and lengthy process, which included uh, extensive research literature review, um, many, many interviews with industry leaders that allowed us to come up with an initial design. And then once we had an initial concept, we then tested and refined that through a stakeholder engagement process, where we came up with what we'll call our final model by the end of 2022. So 2023 has largely been implementation. So I'll touch on that in future slides as well. But this is all just to illustrate that this was a rather robust and lengthy process to come up with this model. And um, this is leading back to uh, the filling in some of the workforce gaps that are existing today. Through that extensive research analysis, we did notice that there were not a lot of opportunities for individuals at the associate's level or bachelor's level. Um, it often was certificates or jumping up to master's and above. So the intention of this role, again, this is just an illustrative example of where the wellness coach one and two fit in, um, is to offer more employment opportunities for entry level behavioral health professions. And the intention as we're working through this too is to create a bridge so that we are um, focusing on degrees and programs that will allow individuals to advance into more advanced behavioral health professions, should they so desire. So for those that are interested in becoming a wellness coach, we do have certification requirements. And our certification, uh, I'll talk through our high-level timeline in one of our later slides, the certification is targeted to launch by early 2024, so in just a few months, we will be opening certification and HKI will be the certifying entity for that. And there are currently gonna be two different pathways um, to qualify for certification. The first one is our education pathway. And these are for those that are just now entering into um, a degree program or recent graduates of a degree program. And uh, the degrees required for a wellness coach one, you must have an associate's degree in order to apply for certification and a bachelor's degree for wellness coach two. Um, the majors that we're focusing on are those that are in social work, health and human services and addiction studies. And that is because uh, as we did analysis, there are inherently field practicum, uh, more of that real experience uh, that goes into these degree programs, 
Um, so we felt that this was a great way to provide the necessary competencies and skill set in order to enter into the workforce as a wellness coach upon graduation. They also do need field experience. We can see that it's 400 hours for Wellness Coach 1 and an additional 400 hours on top of that for Wellness Coach 2. And um, these can be through a combination both of what they uh, receive during their degrees, as well as if they have uh, work already in the field. Our other pathway is for those that are currently working uh, in the behavioral health workforce in a similar capacity, and we're calling this our workforce pathway. They still are required to have an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, but we expanded upon those majors that are accepted, those fields of study that are accepted, to also include child development and early intervention, psychology, and sociology. The difference, uh, in addition to the additional majors that are required, are also a higher um, number of hours of field experience needed. And again, this is for those that are currently part of the behavioral health workforce already. So many of whom are already working in a similar wellness coach-like capacity. And these hours must be in areas of mental health, social work, child welfare, and or addiction and substance use. And again, this can be a combination of hours, both from their degree program, as well as volunteer and um, hours actually working on the job. So uh, for those that are uh, qualified, if you have um, employees that are uh, currently already doing similar work at your organizations and institutions, we do encourage them to apply for certification as soon as that opens uh, within a few months. So high level overview of the services and competencies uh, that are involved in the certified wellness coach role. Uh, this is a preclinical role, so this is really focusing on primary prevention and early intervention services, and you can see those primary ones listed there, of wellness promotion and education, screening, care coordination and extension, individual group support, and crisis referral. Um, we do expand upon these and have been working with organizations to support them in developing out job descriptions, as well as um, some illustrative examples that we will be sharing of what this looks like in practice in subsequent slides. So we'll be expanding on this quite a bit to um, really show what this looks like uh, in practice. Also uh, really important embedded as part of their uh, education and training, as well as ongoing as we do recertification as well, is coming from the lens of cultural responsiveness, humility, and mitigating implicit bias, ensuring that they're apprised of current ethics and legal mandates, as well as a strong sense of professionalism, communication being key, um, coming from a place of empathy, reflective uh, listening, uh, many, many tenets of being a strong communicator, and then the ability to adapt uh, in their role and throughout different environments. So creating a baseline of competencies and learning objectives through their training programs, and then uh, allowing employers to expand upon that training for any specifics or nuanced needs. So as I mentioned, what does this look like in practice? I'm not gonna go through every single one of these, um, but just really wanted to show what this could look like at the school-based health centers and wellness centers. So for wellness promotion education, this could be classroom presentations, uh, focusing on wellness skills, um, mindfulness, substance use prevention, quite a variety. So we really see education as a very important aspect of this and a great way to reduce stigma and continue to make this um, part of the conversation in our schooling, school-based settings. This could also include leading wellness, uh, campus wellness activities, as I mentioned, addressing mental health stigma, um, really more than anything, continuing to build rapport, being another trusted individual on campus or around campuses. Um, we really have heard loud and clear that there cannot be enough uh, trusted adults on campus, another set of eyes, um, and just an overall wellness champion. In terms of screening, um, this is really more about supporting the implementation and facilitation and coordination of universal mental health and wellness uh, student screenings with some examples listed there. Sorry. Um, some targeted screening for specific groups, 
This could also be uh, referring students uh, who are presenting signs of mental distress. So for thinking about our tier one, tier two, tier three um, students, you know, really being there to support our tier one individuals. And then when there are those that are presenting signs of more needed support in our tier two and tier three, that they understand when it's important to um, refer that up to a qualified individual. Let's see. <clears throat> So now when we look at care coordination extension, this could be supporting in case management, uh, navigating, navigating needed external referrals. Um, we really see this as an individual that's embedded as part of the care team. So we're not trying to supplant any roles. We're here to supplement as much as possible. So that can be coordinating with school staff, um, definitely supporting um, being under the direction and guidance of our PPS uh, credentialed individuals or licensed individuals um, outside of the uh, school setting, um, making sure that they're really working to develop strong relationships with both internal and external partners, and then being an advocate for the students to ensure that they're getting the care and support they need, being a warm handoff whenever uh, that is required. We can see some more here that a really great thing would be check-in, check-out support. Um, we do have uh, a Great individual here, Mike, who will be able to you know, touch on some of that, but he has been a huge advocate for check-in, check-out. Um, also supporting student, uh, students individually with mental health education, uh, relationship support, other topics. So again, that one-on-one -on -one guidance uh, to provide need or support as needed and identify when there is um, more intensive support and making sure to be at the warm handoff for those individuals as they are um, progressed along. And some other examples here that we can see in group support um, can be coordinating and leading non-clinical skill building groups around mindfulness, anger management, um, socialization, stress management. Um, again, we can, when we're thinking through that diversity lens, that representation lens, they could lead or co-lead culturally specific or gender specific groups. And again, we're doing uh, as much as we can to really recruit and support um, as much representation in our wellness coaches because we know that our students and our uh, youth want to see individuals that look like them, that talk like them, that understand their experience. Uh, so that is a big aspect of what we're doing when we think about our marketing and our overall approach and how we're our, uh, supporting uh, potential applicants to become certified. And then also uh, crisis referral, really understanding, again, these are individuals that are integrated as part of the crisis response team. Um, and that ideally we would see additional training uh, to support them in their um, services to children and youth. And that could include things like youth mental health first aid and question, persuade and refer. So again, just some illustrative examples. We'll be sending out these slides as well as this recording so you can dive into this a little bit more. Uh, but wanted to make sure that we were giving some real world context of what this could look like in practice. So who could become a wellness coach? Um, this is for those, as we mentioned, um, some people might already be in their related education or doing similar work. We've heard as we do uh, more and more um, connection with the workforce that many people already have similar roles like this. So this could just be a value add for them to become certified and um, continue on and we'll, we'll mention how there's some benefits to funding and some additional sustainability measures that really could support uh, both the individuals and the organization. But this can be really anybody and anybody, um, everybody and anybody rather. Um, we're really welcoming all backgrounds, all levels of experience um, to apply as long as there is uh, a desire to work with children and youth and support them in their overall mental well-being. So this is a lot of text, but this is, again, just an illustrative example of where wellness coaches um, could offer services, schools being a very major one. Uh, of course, that's where we can get in front of many of our children and youth, but also community-based organizations. Um, so really, we think as the big uh, primary focus being school-linked, um, school-based services and support, but also health centers, um, again, and as we're discussing with this group here, school-based health centers and wellness centers being an absolutely integral way 
to um, support mental and behavioral health um, in our school systems. So you can also see that we're looking at government centers as well, um, even telehealth. So we are really trying to provide a system and a setting where um, they can be integrated into any care team as long as an organization can see that this would be a value add. So I've alluded to a few of these things during the presentation, um, but our kind of long-term and major benchmarks that are coming up here in the coming years, uh, coming months and years. As I mentioned, we are doing uh, a rather broad marketing campaign right now. We are very close to launching our Wellness Coach website that'll have even more information. This is gonna provide information to the general public uh, so they can really understand why a wellness coach was being developed, how this can support um, them, their families, their communities at large. But then there's also gonna be a lot of guided information for potential applicants, for potential employers, um, even for training programs. So we, um, I should say our education programs. Um, so there's gonna be a lot more information and we are gearing to launch that within a couple of weeks. So um, we do have a, um, Webs I'm sorry, a uh, yeah, website as well as an email address that we'll be providing. Uh, so definitely stay tuned for uh, even more information in the next few weeks. Um, I mentioned also that certification is getting close to being launched. So we are developing out a certification platform now um, that is going to be launched. Uh, we're targeting early 2024, and that's for applicants um, that are already qualified and can enter um, and apply for certification as soon as that opens. Um, we're also developing out right now grant opportunities, and this is for our employers. And that's also gonna be launching in early 2024, expected to launch in January and be open for about two months from January through March. And that is to support our employers in hiring on a wellness coach and covering the cost of their salary, compensation and benefits, and even some support um, for supervision. So we're doing whatever we can to ensure that there's not barriers for our employers so that as soon as those wellness coaches get certified, employers are ready to go and hire them on. When we think about um, you know, really supporting a representative workforce, a diverse workforce, we want to try and reduce barriers as much as possible. So we're also offering scholarships to support students entering into education programs because we want to make sure that the cost of education as much as possible is not a limiting factor. And we're even looking at um, covering educational expenses, um, living, um, so, you know, some aspects of cost of living as well. So we're in the development of that now, um, but that is something that's expected to be launched in uh, mid-2024. We are also communicating with our California community colleges, our CSUs, and some other uh, public institutions to build out a uh, custom wellness coach education program. These will be considered HKI designated training programs, and eventually that's the only programs that we will accept um, training and education from. Uh, but because those things take time, that's why we're kind of doing this um, immediate certification for those that are already in related uh, fields and capacities. But uh, we are in the process of continuing to connect, as I mentioned, with our CCs and CSUs um, to develop out those programs. So we'll be on our website continuing to have a running list as more and more get added to that beginning um, for entry for those new students in fall of 2024. And then as I'm sure many of you have questions around is the long-term sustainability measures. So we do have grants that are gonna be launched in 20, early 2024, but that is just gap finance and gap funding uh, as we march towards building out wellness coaches as a reimbursable provider type and having their services covered, um, particularly in school link school-based settings through the multi-payer fee schedule. Um, so that's a, you know, a big aspect of this role is that this will actually have some sustainability measures to have their services covered to offset the cost of hiring on these individuals as part of your. So definitely some big things coming up in the next few weeks, as well as many big things coming up uh, in 2024 as well. So at this time, I know I just presented a lot of information and I'm sure many of you have some questions. 
So uh, I think we might take down this slide and then we'll have an opportunity to um, field some questions. And Amy, I'm not sure if you have some already in the queue that we'd love to. Yes, thank you uh, so much, Ben. Yeah. Uh, we did uh, give an opportunity for folks to ask questions as they registered. So we have some questions already and then people have been dropping things into the chat. So I wanted to just start with um, a question that came up in the registration, but also that I can tell folks are wanting more information and more clarification on. And that's, if you could maybe talk a little bit more about the two pathways, the education pathway and the work workforce pathway for those who already have some experience. I think particularly, what are the differences? If you could talk about that. Also, there's questions about the majors that are um, acceptable. And um, if you could just talk a little bit more about how that works, what what were the decisions about that? Because um, I think there's maybe concern that there's folks that are not going to be able to utilize their expertise because what they might have an AA degree that is not represented. Yep, absolutely. Um, so the education pathway, again, are for those that are uh, new in the field. So this would be those that are recently enrolled or recently graduated and just beginning on in their um, education, um, I don't wanna say education career, but beginning, you know, just entering into their education. And the reason that we focused on social work, health and human services and addiction studies was largely due to our stakeholder engagement process. We went through a very extensive process with many different individuals across a variety of sectors to come up with what does it look like to adequately prepare our wellness coaches who are going to be offering behavioral health support to our children and youth? Uh, what does it look like to prepare these individuals to be workforce ready? And so there was many, many different topics that came up through that, many, many learning objectives, um, types of courses that were going to be offered. And the original thought was that we would create a wellness coach specific degree. As we have spent more time with our community colleges and our CSUs, we realized that coming up with a new degree, one, uh, isn't always necessary or required, and two, takes a lot of time. So what we've done is that is a, a rather extensive crosswalk analysis of great, we have all these courses and topics. What does that look like and how does that already exist? And we do see a very strong alignment, not surprisingly, with social work, um, as well as some other, uh, you know, again, health and human services and addiction studies programs. So in an effort to meet the need of getting people qualified now, uh, I'm sorry, people that are already qualified, certified now, while also simultaneously making sure that we are standing up and responding to our stakeholder engagement process, those were the short list of degrees that we felt most closely aligned with those that were part of that stakeholder engagement process. But as we did more and more work, um, so that's the, the education pathway is really what was our stakeholder designed um, training requirements. The workforce pathway was kind of our response to help expand upon that because as we actually have been connecting with employers, discussing who's already in the field, we realize that there are those that are already doing similar work, uh, but that the degrees that they have are often beyond just those three that we mentioned. Um, but in an effort to still ensure that a lot of the training and requirements still aligned as much, uh, you know, ideally as we could with uh, those topics, that's where we expanded into psychology, sociology, and child development and early intervention. Um, the intention of why we're not accepting every degree across the board was rather extensive. Um, this is our first iteration of getting certification launched. Again, balancing that need of our stakeholders while also doing what we can to bring in as many as we could. Um, we are going to continue to assess, continue to look at how we can expand, optimize, improve upon uh, future iterations. So this is not to say that if right now individuals that um, are doing the work are not qualified now does not mean that they won't ever be. It's that right now for our first launch of certification, this was what was determined um, kind of through balancing those needs. So hopefully that addresses the question if there's anybody here who has a use case or something where they might want to discuss this in more detail, please reach out to us and we can assess discuss, um, and any information for us that can help us understand 
what it looks like in practice and what's actually happening out in the state uh, is very beneficial. So hopefully, Amy, that addresses those questions. Yeah, and so it sounds like um, there still might be, as as the wellness coach profession is is more robust, there might be some opportunities down the road that uh, there might be other ways for folks to be kind of grandfathered in to a wellness coach, or will always sort of have this requirement of certain majors. And I, I'm bringing this up because there's folks that obviously have been doing the work in schools in many of these exact same capacities of a wellness coach um, who, you know, are not going to go back and get an A day degree in social work. So right. just wondering about that. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I'd, I'd love to say, yes, we're going to continue to expand upon it. But at this point, you know, I, I have no defined uh, examples of what that will look like and the timing. Um, we are doing whatever we can, again, to uh, be as inclusive as possible, while also making sure that we are being responsive to that, that stakeholder engagement process. Um, so, um, you know, as we get this in here, or as we get our certification launched, and as we uh, get some data and analysis, that's something that we'll definitely going to keep top of mind. Okay, great. Um, I think there's also been questions about what, what does it mean to be certified? Is, there, is it an exam? Is it just a you know, submitting, I have this degree and I've done this many hours in this setting. Can you just elaborate a little bit more about that? Yeah, so certification, um, it's really a, a certification process. And so there is not going to be an exam associated with that. Um, we know that that is typical a lot of times, but because individuals are required to have an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, we felt that that was more than sufficient uh, examination that they'll do throughout that process. And then the process itself for applying for certification is going to be going on to HKI's certification portal, um, uploading contact information, proof of education, associated forms. So we're going to be looking for our verification. Um, we'll have a letter of recommendation, um, uploading unofficial transcripts. So just doing some things. We're trying to keep it as simple as possible, but it's uh, intended to be a rather easy certification process. And as long as those uh, basics are met, then individual will be granted certification and can enter into the workforce very quickly. So um, it'll be a direct process through HKI um, online portal. Thanks. Uh, another bunch of questions have come in related to supervision. So if you could speak a little bit about that, are there requirements around who can supervise wellness coaches or recommendations? Are there a PPS requirement? Um, what school yeah. district employee versus CBO? Any any more details about supervision would be great. Yeah, each guy is doing what they can to recommend best practices and what we think uh, would be the best supervisors for them in the school system. We see that as PPS credentialed individuals, uh, and outside of that, licensed clinicians. But those are just recommendations because we understand that whether it's due to capacity, bandwidth, or availability overall, that that may not always be the best person, um, depending on whatever regional um, structure there is for each organization. So we um, are just providing those as guidance, and we really look to our employers to determine who is the best direct supervisor that is qualified to support these individuals. Um, when it comes to school settings, we know that there are specific laws, uh, ed codes under like who must be overseeing the broader program. Um, so we know that you know most of those do fall under a PPSC in the school system. And then of course we need a, a licensed clinician to oversee any type of uh, clinics, wellness centers. Um, but we really want our employers to have some uh, flexibility in determining what the structure of their care team looks like. Great, thank you. Um, so sustainability is always a big question and concern for folks uh, doing this work. Um, is this a good time to delve a little bit more deeply into how um, CYBHI might be thinking about future sustainability via the multi-payer fee schedule 
what might be reimbursable um, because certainly not all things that wellness coaches do or could do would be reimbursable, but we'd love to to delve into that a little bit. Yeah, and um, I'll just, you know, very high level. I know that the multi-payer fee schedule is due to launch January of 2024, but wellness coaches uh, are still undergoing a state plan amendment and to, you know, to get authority to actually be added to that. And they will not be added to the fee schedule until January of 2025. Um, so very high level, that is the timeline there. But I would also love to uh, pass this over to Autumn, our representative from DHCS, who can expand on that a little bit more. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Autumn Boyle, and I'm with the California Department of Healthcare Services. And I can answer the questions related to the CYBHI multi-payer fee schedule. Uh, we will be seeking at DHCS a state plan amendment to um, ensure that we have appropriate federal authority for wellness coaches. Um, and we'll plan to submit the state plan amendment in 2024 uh, with an effective date of January 1st, 2025. So we will um, add wellness coaches uh, to the multi-payer fee schedule once we have the appropriate authority under the state plan. So starting in January of 2025. Are there, uh, I know that there's a couple of other specific questions, Amy, in the chat. So I don't know if you want yeah, um, to. Yeah, there's a yeah, yeah, a lot of different questions. We're really going to try to get to as many as we can, but I can tell already we're not going to get to all the questions. Uh, so we will do our best to get information out to you. Um, I think that, uh, you know, not everyone might be that familiar with the multi-payer fee schedule on this call, but um, if you could speak a little bit to how um, certain, you know, parts of the scope of a wellness coach might, I know we still, it's all pending the approval, but might be services that would be billable that um, would allow a school-based health center, a wellness center, a school or an organization to get some reimbursement to support the role of a wellness coach. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about scope. Sure. Yeah, so the, the CYBHI multi-payer fee schedule will include a variety of services across uh, four primary categories, um, psychoeducation services, screening and assessment, therapeutic treatment services, and case management or care coordination services. Uh, the services of a wellness coach, um, as Ben described, earlier in the presentation that will be included under psychoeducation or screening and assessment, for example. Um, however, uh, similar to the way that we um, structured the state plan amendment for community health workers, where we uh, created a new benefit category for community health workers, not just added provider types to the state plan would likely do the same type of thing for wellness coaches so that the wellness coach services would be a benefit category that would be inclusive of all of the activities that Ben described earlier in terms of the model of services for a wellness coach. Okay, great, thank you. Um, part of your, your audio cut out for a minute, but hopefully the main points got across. Um, and so would, I think one of the, maybe this is getting too much into the weeds and if that, so that's okay, we can defer to later, but I think questions are coming up about how um, the billing could, would work and how complex is it? How um, difficult would it be for say a community-based organization or a healthcare organization who hires a wellness coach to be able to, to bill for reimbursement? So for through the fee schedule, um, the local education agencies are kind of central to the provider network structure of the multi-payer fee schedule. And so any organizations that are affiliated with a local education agency and designated by the local education agency as an eligible practitioner would be able to bill for services under the fee schedule structure. So that would include services provided by a wellness coach once we have state plan authority for 
the wellness coach services in January of 2025. Great, thank you. Um, pulling a couple of questions from the Q&A. Um, there's questions about a list of community colleges or CSUs that will be either part of the training or if you can like specify, I think folks are concerned about folks that might be in more rural areas of California, ensuring that there is access to the training programs. Yeah, so um, as far as the education programs that will be allowed, uh, we are working with our community colleges and CSUs now um, to offer these um, and become an HKI designated training program. But what we're doing in the the close or the near term, again, is that those pre-qualified pathways. And I do see someone here saying that we are 90 miles away from the closest CCC. So definitely looking at, um, you know, any type of classes that can be taken online that can qualify as well. So, um, you know, for those that are concerned about availability, we definitely can connect and discuss what that might look like um, to ensure that these availabilities are offered for our individuals in rural uh, regions as well. So happy to connect in and look at that in a little bit more detail, knowing that there's going to be regionally um, specific differences. So please don't hesitate to reach out and we'll make sure to offer our uh, wellness coach email so that you can contact us. Um, another question for you. How is HKI ensuring that the wellness coach workforce will be representative of California's diverse children and youth? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are doing many things when we um, think about our marketing, as well as our grants and scholarships. So marketing, uh, we're taking a lot of efforts. We have um, engaged with children, youth, and families, as well as many organizations that specifically specialize in equity um, to really think about how do we strategically get this information out and make sure that um, the individuals that are potential applicants are aware of this opportunity uh, coming from these different um, demographics, backgrounds, experiences. Uh, we are doing what we can to really think about uh, weighting our scoring when it comes to scholarships and grants for those that are supporting um, underserved populations. So that could be looking at rural communities, that could be looking at Title I schools, that can be looking at those that have experienced homelessness, um, so quite a few things are being addressed, and that's something that HKI does in all of their programs, is look at scoring um, when we come from lens of equity, diversity, representation. Um, so there's a lot of things that we are embedding into all of our programs inherently, uh, but then continuing to make sure that our children, our youth, our families, our communities have a voice and continue to be part of the program, and that is something that CYBHI uh, broadly is continuing to do. Um, they've done equity toolkits. They're continuing to have um, uh, equity groups, uh, learning groups. So we continue to embed and integrate both stuff from our department level as well as a broader agency level um, in terms of coming from that lens. Um, so hopefully that addresses that. We can always provide more specifics if people wanna know exactly what does that look like. Great, thank you. There's been some questions in the chat also that we got ahead of time. I think, um, Autumn, you maybe addressed a little bit in the chat, but maybe we can just out loud talk about the distinctions. I think there is there is some uh, confusion about the different uh, providers in terms of community health worker versus PPS versus certified wellness coach. And so maybe we can just help people understand these different roles and, and how it all fits together. Do you and want you me to talk start? about the, yeah, I'll talk about, you know, just the general broad categorization. And then when it comes down to billing and, you know, how that's structured in the fee schedule, I'll, I'll definitely let Autumn address that. Um, but, you know, the wellness coach, we just want to continue to reiterate that this is specifically focusing on behavioral health and specifically focusing on children and youth. So they have a little bit more of a narrow lens on the type of specialty that they're focusing on. Um, there can definitely be some overlap inherently when we're talking about preclinical services. So inherently there might be some support around substance use, um, but you know we definitely see our like peer support specialists, for example, they come from a very strong lens of lived experience, helping support those through recovery, 
um, through addiction. And so they might be more specialized in that lane. Our community health workers, again, um, of course, are going to be supporting children, youth, and families, but they're more directly embedded into their community, helping navigating community resources, really supporting and integrating with families. Um, whereas again, our wellness coaches are very much specifically focused on our children and youth in that behavioral health capacity, which is why we're continuing to focus on our schooling, school-based settings uh, as a way to support them by getting in front of those target populations. Um, so that's very broad level, uh, but I'll let Autumn, you know, if there's anything you want to expand upon within that, uh, that would help illustrate. Thanks, Ben. I guess I would just uh, reiterate what I said in the chat for other folks. Uh, from a medical perspective, um, the wellness coaches, which we haven't yet um, developed the state plan amendment for, so still work to be done there, but the wellness coaches will um, uh, provide kind of a career ladder. So community health workers would then uh, step up to the wellness coach level because there's differing training and education requirements has been just described. I would also clarify too that uh, peer support specialists from a medical perspective are only authorized in the state plan in terms of the county run med, uh, med uh, especially mental health services program, the drug medical program and the drug medical organized delivery system program. So peer support specialists that are certified um, through the California Mental Health Services Authority or CalMESA, um, those only function within a county-run uh, Department of Behavioral Health um, and not within the managed care structure or, or in medical fee-for-service. And so um, while the service activities are very similar, um, I would agree with Ben that they have different roles to play in the overall delivery system. There's different training and education requirements, different certification requirements, and it's it's a it's just a unique role that HCI is developing for services provided to students, primarily, although not exclusively, in school settings. Thank you. I think we have time for another question or two, and then I'm gonna do some final slides. But clearly, there's a lot of questions that we're not getting to which tells me that people are really engaged and interested in learning more about this topic and seeing how this is relevant to the work and how we can think about um, new ways to incorporate wellness coaches into our staffing. Um, I wanted to just see if Autumn, you might be able to just say a few words about the questions that are related to FQHCs and PPS rate, because I think that's something that a number of our school-based health centers are FQHCs. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll put out some additional guidance about that specific issue, but our current thinking is that for FQ, FQHCs who are reimbursed at the PPS rate, the billing would work the same way that it does today, um, and there wouldn't be a change for Medi-Cal enrolled members. Um, however, for commercial enrollees, FQHCs and school-based health centers could still submit claims for reimbursement at the published fee schedule rates for those commercially enrolled uh, uh, students who are receiving their coverage as part of a commercial plan or through a disability insurance plan regulated by the California Department of Insurance. And so it's, uh, it's a little bit confusing because it's a little bit of uh, existing status quo, nothing changes, and there's this new opportunity to get reimbursed for services provided to students outside of the Medi-Cal context. Thank you so much. And I hope that folks are noticing in the chat, we've dropped a whole lot of helpful links um, where to get more information from HCI, their website, as well as specifics about the multi-payer fee schedule. There's a really helpful short video that can, can give you a real base understanding of how it's gonna work as well as links to their website. Um, we will continue to be um, uplifting any trainings that are coming. We are working closely with our state partners to try to help the school health and wellness world really um, think about this on the ground and what that might look like. Um, so I think that what I'm gonna do now is go back to our final slides, but I really appreciate everyone's many, many questions and I apologize that 
we could not get to all of them. Um, so let's just... There again is um, the resources to reach out to HKI for any further questions. You can also reach out to us at CSHA because we are really trying to compile questions that are coming up so we can share out with our partners um, who are you know, trying to figure out this puzzle and we wanna help, um, help you not have to do all that work individually. Some upcoming opportunities with the California School-Based Health Alliance. We are gonna be doing a peer-to-peer -peer programs learning collaborative in February and March. It's gonna be a deep dive for folks that really want to bring peer-to-peer -peer support programs to their schools. And um, so keep an eye out for our um, announcement around that. It will be in the CSHA newsletters that hopefully all of you do receive. Uh, we're also gonna host a youth-led webinar that is gonna highlight peer counseling programs across the state. So these are high school students who are trained to do peer-to-peer -peer work. And again, I see this fitting really nicely with wellness coaches. Schools can have more staff able to really support um, peer-led programs. Um, there's also another CYBHI webinar coming up in just a couple of days on the virtual services platform. And this is really um, a platform that's getting developed to really connect youth and families with information and self-management tools, um, coaching supports. Uh, so more information will be shared in a couple of days on that. And there is also a webinar this Thursday that is about a funding opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer programs. This is um, $10 million that the state has allocated. Well, actually 8 million, excuse me. Um, that's going to support high schools that want to start peer-to-peer -peer mental health programs. So if you wanna learn more about that um, funding opportunity, um, you can tune into that website. I believe we can drop that um, link into the chat. So you have it. Um, and then finally, I just want to say thank you so much for being here with us to learn together. We are here to um, help connect you with folks that have answers to your questions. Please feel free to reach out. Uh, the HKI email is also there for further questions and our contacts. As you log off to today's webinar, you're gonna get an automatic pop-up to do a very brief evaluation. We really hope that you'll spend one more minute um, to give us some feedback. Let us know what other topics, um, specifically around CYBHI or school health services in general, that would be helpful for us to, to bring to you. Um, and with that, I'll just say thank you very much. Please reach out and um, have a great rest of your day.